and welcome to Sussex Street Christian Centre Reflection Series, looking at the Gospel of Mark. We'll be working through Mark by looking at each chapter's subheadings, a series of around 72 such reflections. We hope you're blessed by them, and that they help you develop your own relationship with God. Also, that this series will inspire you to become an active part of God's kingdom where you live. Today, we are looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. I'm reading from the New International Version. This passage has the subheading of The Rich Young Man. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This passage records an encounter which is told about in Matthew chapter 19 and also in Luke chapter 18. Whilst Luke describes the person approaching Jesus as a ruler, and Matthew states that he was young, here in Mark we are told only that the person is a man a man who runs up to Jesus and falls on his knees before him. All three Gospels state that the man is wealthy and that he knows the commandments as given by God to the people of Israel through Moses. These are listed in Exodus chapter 20. In spite of his having such riches, the man appears to be dissatisfied, worrying about death as he asks Jesus how he can inherit eternal life. He shows respect, prefacing his question by addressing Jesus as good teacher. When he states that he has kept the commandments since boyhood, Jesus presses him as to whether he did, in fact, have certain things that he valued more greatly than God. In his case, the man's riches were in the way. They were, to him, a stumbling block, and this situation needed to change. 
At this stage, at least, the man is unable to comply, and so he goes away, disheartened, and realising that a nominal observation of the commandments has proved inadequate, as he realises his love for certain categories of neighbour. For those poorer than him, for example, is lacking. Jesus has made it clear that eternal life is, in fact, the same as following him, and that, in turn, it involves choosing between Jesus and the lifestyle that he has now. That conversation leads to a second one with the disciples. We read that they were amazed at Jesus' remarks about the incompatibility between people of means and the kingdom of God. This to the extent that they ask whether, in fact, anyone can be saved. Jesus agrees that with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. In other words, doing things in our own human strength will not bear fruit, whereas being in a close relationship with God and allowing him to direct our lives is the correct attitude. Accepting that his strength is made perfect in our weakness, as Paul was to write later in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The man who approaches Jesus was probably a God-fearing Jew, someone who was brought up to obey the law. Most believed that by doing so, they would be rewarded as a result of their actions and good behaviour. They thought that they were God's chosen people after all. He considers Jesus to be a rabbi and seeks favour in addressing him as good teacher. At this stage, the man would not know Jesus' true identity, and so he is reminded that rabbis are men, and that men cannot be good to the extent that God the Father is good. Perhaps Jesus wished also to curb what might be a rather gushing attempt at flattery before saying what was uppermost in that man's mind about what a good law-abiding citizen and observer of the faith he was. Jesus, however, isn't over-impressed by this man's box-ticking approach to salvation. Instead, he's more interested in how important the spirit of his law-keeping has been, especially of those commandments that deal with how we relate to our neighbours. As noted already, Jesus recognises that beneath a veneer of respectability lies a major stumbling block. And this is an impediment to his joining a good and full relationship with God the Father. In this man's case, the stumbling block which disqualified him was about finance. But perhaps for others, there might be different things that prevent us from demonstrating that God comes first in our lives. It might be about our careers, family matters, where we are on the property ladder, how our leisure time is used to do with an unhealthy friendship group, wanting to impress, seeking of status or power in areas where we meet others, how we operate and behave in our churches even. It's a reality that most of us depend upon a certain amount of money to live. We need it to buy food, to buy clothes, to travel, to keep our loved ones safe and warm, to honour others with gifts, contribute to important public services through our systems of taxation, and to play our part in keeping the local and national economy stable. Also, our churches need enough income to stay afloat, and we are taught to give generously in order to ensure that they function in a manner that is honourable to God, that those who work in Christian service are likewise adequately paid, to the extent that they and their dependents also do not go without. Having sufficient people in our church congregations able to give regularly supports this principle considerably. Each and every one of us ought to be making some contribution at least to our home churches as our actual circumstances allow. The exact amount and its frequency will be between us as individuals and God of course. For the man we have read about here there might be a number of reasons why he was preoccupied with his being wealthy, and why his being wealthy was so apparent that it was worth commenting upon, not just here in Mark, but in the Gospels attributed 
to Matthew and Luke as well. Maybe this was reflected in the way he dressed, or by other external pointers. Equally, Jesus was, of course, well able to discern such matters fully enough for himself, and more importantly, to identify what needed to change as he answered the man's question in a loving and compassionate manner. Maybe this man's money was hard-earned, the result of a successful business, either established from scratch or inherited by, through the man's family and intended to be passed on in due course to his own heirs. He might have been an exceptional sportsman or maybe a skilled clinician. Maybe it was because he held a particular position of influence which came with an attractive salary, together with other benefits that came with such an high office. Maybe the simple fact of his being wealthy could lead to more personal privileges, entry into a new circle of friends, further career advancement, becoming a more attractive suitor, or just being better recognised and admired. With such things come influence, status and power, sometimes denied to others who might actually have rather preferable abilities, experience, knowledge, skills, enthusiasm, and a willingness to engage in a given situation. Then as now, doubtless there were major inequalities in society, large gaps between the expectations of those who had little and those who had much. Jesus thinks that this man would be able to make a generous and most welcome contribution were he choose to choose to sell up and follow him instead. Accepting such a challenge required a very different approach to the Jewish faith, as understood by this man up to then, of course. A requirement instead depend on God entirely for his every future need. Jesus elaborates on this as he discusses the incident with his disciples, who have already begun to exercise this level of faith and realise that they won't be returning to their past lifestyles. Not now that they have accepted the challenge to obey Jesus and follow him for the remainder of their lives. In verses 30 and 31, we read that the future involves self-denial, sacrifice and persecution. A need to put the needs of others before what might have been the disciples' own priorities, not all that many months previously. In saying, but many who are first will be last, and the last first, Jesus states that in the kingdom of God, our being able to boast of earthly wealth, power and status is immaterial. Rather, relying on these may risk our disqualification unless we acknowledge God as sovereign and Jesus as Lord. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Already, they are on the way to Jerusalem, having crossed back into Galilee. And Jesus has begun to explain what is going to happen when they get there. Now let's pray together. Our Father God, thank you that this passage reminds us how all things are possible with you and demonstrates also that it is through trusting in and following Jesus Christ, your Son, that we obtain hope, assurance, and your comfort in our lives. We ask that you would help us continually to be thankful for all that you provide, for our food, our families, our friends, and for our livelihoods, and that we maintain a responsible attitude to our money our possessions and how we use our time. May it be that we do not allow anything to come before you in a manner that damages the precious relationship that you have established with each one of us who acknowledges you as Lord. We ask these things through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.